I got love for you, man. You know what, I'm what are we talking about? You know, I'm not here to start any trouble. I'm only going to say nice things about you from now on. I think you're handsome, and I think you're a wonderful host. I'm fat and I'm overweight. Just don't say anything silly. I was waiting for you to say that. I'm not laughing about it. You think this is funny? I take this serious. You know, I don't want y'all to take anything that out of context that I'm saying. He's very funny. He likes to joke around a lot. As a personality and as an entertainer, yes. This is going to be really quick. I'm not taking any questions. Go ahead and get comfortable. I'm going to talk for a little bit. You're listening to Cabby Presents, the podcast. What's up, everybody? Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is Cabby Richards beaming into your speakers. Congratulations to the San Francisco Giants for winning your second World Series in three years and seventh in franchise history. The Giants now have the distinction of winning... The most boring World Series since the Red Sox swept the Cardinals in 2004. That was terrible. I mean, shout out to everybody in San Francisco rioting and then, you know, smashing all those wonderful fish restaurants you got out there and carrying on and acting like Madonna's dancers on some kind of methamphetamine. I'm not sure what that means. Here's, I have an idea. Okay, this is my idea on how we increase the entertainment value for fans that have no emotional connection to either team in the finals. This goes for any sport, or the four majors, let's say, and will include college basketball and college um, football as well. And, you know, I know we, we ask for more transparency with the government and you know, our favorite teams, you know, general managers, you know, just to be a little more honest with us as the public. And certainly through Twitter and Instagram, we get to we get a little glimpse, but we need the full glimpse. And and I'm not sure how this gets done, but maybe it would have to start in college because of the relationships of players with their significant others. But to the executives at HBO or Showtime or pay-per-view, or Oscar De La Hoya's, you know, his uh, promotional company, we put together, they put together a behind-the-scenes, unfiltered, uncensored recap of the 72 hours following the winning moment of a championship. Make it three parts. One hour each. Or, or a two-hour event exactly one week later. And the cameras... They film everything, and they go everywhere. You know you're going to get the rawest emotion, the camaraderie, the language, and the sex drugs, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That's my idea. I don't know which team would agree to it, but I think it would be off the charts. It would be something that it would be like the Project X. You could even call it that. You know, Project X wins the Super Bowl or the NBA, uh, you know, the NBA champion Project X. I'd pay a minimum of $100 to watch that, no problem, as long as, as it's completely unfiltered. That's my idea. Go ahead and run with it. This is the first mega cast on Cabby Presents with three guests, and it's all NFL. On top of that, it's all defense. Why? Because defense wins championships, and defensive players, they're funnier. All my guests have played in the Super Bowl, so to say these guys are talented dudes is an understatement. From my Tennessee Titans, you will hear the voice of a player that burst onto the NFL scene with a moniker that fits beast mode. He joins me on the phone right now. If it's going to be uh, an interview, I'm going to conduct it. So I'll answer my own questions, ask myself the questions, then give y'all the answers. Affectionately known as the freak, Javon Curse uh, was a specimen. And if a statue of this man was crafted, then sent to the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., it would not fairly represent this man's athletic stature. A defensive end who spent most of his years with the Tennessee Titans is now an ambassador for the NFL. Javon Curse, welcome to my show. 
man, thanks for having me on. I couldn't have, I, I couldn't have given myself a better intro than that right there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm a huge Tennessee Titans fan, and uh, I'll admit this to you. My first, and it, okay, and it's not you, but my first ever man crush was Eddie George, who was a teammate of yours for a little bit. Yeah, at uh, oh, man, that's my dog right there. He's a good guy. Yeah, I, I can. You know, I've never met him, and. Uh, I, I once saw him at an all-star, like an NBA all-star party in Los Angeles, and I didn't go introduce myself just in case, like, he wasn't having a good time. You know when you really revere someone and, like, you, you know, you go to, you go to meet them and, and they, it falls below their expectations? I didn't want that to happen with Eddie George. No, not with that dude. No, he's a real good guy. I'm sure. I'm sure you can go to Eddie anytime. He's very approachable. Okay. Well, see, well, I, I know that now, but at the time I was just too nervous. And like, you know, I didn't want to, you know, be like drooling on myself, you know, say the wrong thing. You know, yeah. huh, what's that? And, and really like the, the, the same thing with me, like when I got drafted there, like, like when I, when I got the phone call from Coach Fisher to come play for the Tennessee Titans, I'm like, man. Number nine, Steve McNair and Eddie George. That's right. Oh, goodness. Yes, I'm looking forward for that. Like, I, I can't lie, but when I got there, I didn't show that, like, how excited I was just to be just to be around them, just to be amongst them, whatever. But but definitely, I was, I, I know what you're talking about, though. So, okay, so now, okay, quickly, like, I remember Eddie George had these Adidas commercials. I don't know if you remember these. Remember when he's, like, running in the pool? And he's yeah. like, you just see like the dude, his, his physique was, was, was similar to yours in that you guys were made out of marble. Did you guys ever have a pose down in the, uh, uh <laughs> in Tennessee? No, nah, we don't do that. Not yet, but now that we're getting older, we, we may have to have a pose down to just see who, who's standing, who's standing in better shape now. But I think he would win that one because Eddie's serious about that and he, he also follows a strict diet. He was one of the first dudes, the first, uh, athletes I heard of that um, used to work out by doing yoga or at, would add yoga to his workouts. Did you ever add yoga to your workouts? It came much later on, like really like I would say <laughs> maybe about uh, five or six years ago, and Eddie was doing it the whole time. So, Dude, I just did hot yoga for the first time. And it was so humbling. Like, I'm in a room with, like, 25 women. And, you know, I'm, like, trying hard to do these exercises and these stretches and hold these poses and not look like a complete friggin' buffoon. So, like, it made the workout even harder because, you know, you're trying to look cool. Whenever you're around women and, like, working out, you try to look cool. You have to, like, have some sort of uh, calm and some sort of, uh, I don't know, presence or whatever. But... It was it was tough, man. Did you, so, in your yoga workouts, Javon, do you ever incorporate hot yoga into them? Man, no, I don't need that. Okay, because <laughs> you're not fat buddies, like me. All, all of my buddies who are former athletes said that they've uh, um, with my buddies who have tried the hot yoga. They didn't play tough, guys. They said they had to walk out of the room. They had to get out of the room because the heat was not leaving them. It was still, they could not stop the sweat. Well, Javon, you're from Florida, so you can take that hot, humid heat, man. But I can take it outside. So <laughs> we, we use that heat outside. When you're inside and stuck and can't go anywhere, it's, it is, it's not fair there. Okay, that's okay. That that's fair. So I'm on the phone with uh, Javon Curse, and uh, where in the world are you right now? Right now, I'm sitting in my in my living room. In my South Florida home, I'm down in Pompano Beach right now. Pompano Beach. Okay. So as like, as a, and I know you're you're an NFL ambassador doing some work for the NFL, which is awesome. So as a member of this NFL fraternity, how are you treated everywhere you go? I get I get lots of love. I mean, like it's lots of love. Like everywhere I go, and then like really like since I, I've only been out for three years, and I kind of still have a nice looking physique. I get, <laughs> I, I get I get a lot of man. Why don't you man? You like you like you can suit up right now. And I'm like I know I can. And they're like man, uh, man, you should go back out. But man, um, I enjoy watching you play. How come you're not playing anymore? I'm like, um, them knees is a different story there, but oh, everything right. just looks great. <laughs> but that's <laughs> So you mentioned you've so, been. I mean, so Sorry. so like it's always good treatment, like everywhere you go, whatever you get things like that, whatever. But most of the time, um, guys come up to me and they want to reminisce about what you did, about the Music City Miracle, right? About about how did it feel coming up a yard short in, in the Super Bowl? Oh, yeah, Tyson. devastating. And also, 
and the one of the biggest questions is, man, what's T.O. What's T.O. like? Oh, really? Oh, wow. Oh, there's another dude where you, like you, Eddie, and T.O. in your primes. That would be like, that's a, that's a tough one for the judges to adjudicate. You guys could have been like Mr. Olympia contestants. Man, I, I I appreciate you mentioning my name in the along in the same sentence with those two guys. Come on, come on, Javon, dude. Your nickname was the Freak. You were just like you were like your stats know, were off see, the charts, man. That's the hard part. Been having a nickname the Freak, like it's it's something that you got to live up to. Like like when people see me in the street, like they got to be able to look at me and be like, okay, that's what they call the Freak. So it's a it's a certain physique and a certain look that I got to maintain if I, if I still want to live up to that nickname. So, I'm not playing. <laughs> so what you're saying is it's hard being you. <laughs> it's very hard. It's a tough job, but you know what? Somebody has to do it. There you go. So okay. So you mentioned you stopped. So you've stopped playing for three years. How long after you stopped playing were the meals no longer free? Oh man. <laughs> that uh. I, I, I still get a, a few free, free meals here and there, or whatever. But for the most part, I would say um, around my around your second year out, around your second year out, uh, everyone's like, "Oh uh, man, uh, who you play for now?" <laughs> and, and they're, they're asking me this in the fall, like they're asking me this during September, October. And I'm like, "Uh." <laughs> Obviously, no one, because I'm here. You talking to me right now, like on a Wednesday or a Thursday, because yeah. I would be at work those, during those days. But it probably like I, I'll say, like probably like two years out, it, it starts getting a little. Everybody like kind of seems like they kind of forget your name and forget what you did a little bit. Right, right, right. I'm sure that's got to be a little bit of a, an adjustment. But I mean, but I'm sure you're grateful for all the love that you get. But still, a little bit um, of a an adjustment. That's a, See, that's the thing. Like, I'm, I'm cool with it though. I'm like, like I get enough of that. I get enough of that to when I don't get it, I'm cool with it. Like, I love going into like uh, an establishment, a restaurant, or a club or something, and not being the, and not being the biggest name person there because I can slide in and slide out without people wondering like where is such and such or whatever. So. I like being that guy. Nice, which I'm sure it's even even sort of having like in and out missions and trying to operate like covertly might be a little bit challenging for you because you are still six four and like a huge dude. But anyway, I'm sure I'm sure you make it happen. Um, so I just I just read this today. Kevin Durant got approval from uh, the city of Oklahoma to open a restaurant overlooking a canal. Now earlier this summer, Aaron Rodgers and Ryan Braun opened a restaurant called uh, 812 MVP Bar and Grill in the summertime. In your experience as a professional athlete, are restaurants sound investments? Um, repeat that. Are, resta oh, are restaurants yeah. good investments? Like the athletes, you know, Michael Jordan has a restaurant, uh, yeah. Mike Dicka, a bunch of athletes have bought into restaurants. But, uh -huh. you know, from what you've heard from, from your peers or whatever, is that is that Correct. really a sound investment? Is that a good no. way to spend your money? And for my peers, it is not, especially like if, if you're not going to be hands on. That's the main thing, being hands on, because most of most guys who, who, who play in the NFL or the NBA, um, their family and friends think that they have a bunch of disposable income, especially when you're doing a business like that. They figure that you're not going to miss this or miss that, miss a few things here and there, which at the end of the day, once they tally everything up, you end up uh, just making out even. And then when that stuff goes on even more, then you end up losing money. So for the most part, it is not as far as being an athlete if you're busy. Because uh, unless you really have someone like your wife or someone who's really like on top of things, like if you're not there, you're at practice all day, you're, out, you're traveling on the weekend, going to a game, and you don't know what's going on back at the establishment. So for the most part, it isn't unless you're going to be there, like hands on. And most of the time, these guys don't have the time to be hands on. Did you um? Did you see that ESPN uh, Thirty for Thirty documentary, the one called Broke? Did you see that? I had to see that one. Oh man, it's so true. It's so true. What did you like? What were your What were your thoughts? Like they had several like different chapters, and um, you know, one was. Uh, I can't remember what they called it, but one was about family and friends. So at the height of your fame, Javon, and I'm on the phone with Javon Curse, formerly of the Tennessee Titans and the Philadelphia Eagles, at the height of your fame, 
How big was your entourage of family and friends? Oh, man. Well, my friends, um, I never kept um, a big entourage of friends. It was just probably I would sometimes travel with uh, me and my three other buddies, and these are buddies that um, I met back in middle school, middle school, elementary school, middle school. Yeah, that's pretty much it with those guys. And then a couple of guys I would hang out with that I met from high school, but my entourage was just my close buddies who were there with me way from the beginning, but that only went on for maybe, I would say, maybe two or three years, my first two or three years in the league. That probably went on there till I realized, like, wow, I know I'm the only one picking up all the, all the checks, all the tabs, <laughs> so maybe I need to uh, simplify things and right. not have an entourage. So, like, it's just a, a, a lot of that stuff is just experience, learning phase. Like, like you can't go up to these, um, brand new millionaires with all this money, and tell them, listen here, man, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be hanging out with that person. You shouldn't have an entourage. You shouldn't be doing that. And they're like, ah, nah, whatever. Until you experience it yourself, and then that's when you realize all that extra stuff is is really unnecessary. And like, how how compete? And then the other part of the documentary, which I found fascinating, was. Uh, the idea of keeping up with the Joneses. So in Tennessee or in Philadelphia or, or amongst like other athletes, I'm sure you cross paths at like charity events with baseball players and basketball players, maybe even a hockey player when you're yeah. in Philadelphia. How competitive was the idea or the behavior of keeping up with the Joneses? Well, me personally, I never fell into that because <laughs> because if, uh, I don't know if you know how I was I was brought up in a single parent home, mom always gone, so we didn't have much. So once I got things, I knew the difference. So I was never that person who was trying to keep up or whatever. And then you get and then like I remember when I was in, in the league, um, certain situations where guys get drafted to their uh, their rookie their first year, and then um, you know they want to have nice things or whatever, and then. I do remember one situation where this one kid, I forget his name. Oh, find his name. But, find his name, Javon. <laughs> but I forget his name or whatever. But, um, but like, he came to work one day. He was like, man, he's like, man, I need some help. I'm like, what do you need some help with? You in the NFL, what do you need help with? He said, man, I need some help getting his bins. Such and such he just got a new bins, and he's in my class. Um, I think I, I want to get the same kind but a different color. And I'm looking at him like, uh, but you're we signed him. We signed him in the second in the second second round of the draft, and right. we signed you as a free agent. Like right. there's a big difference there. And lo and behold, that guy was out of the NFL probably within probably he did like three more years. So he did probably four years in all. And all of his money was pretty much gone because he was trying to keep up with the next person who who had the money to, to do that. When you got to realize that your money isn't as long as the the next person. Right, right. So, so you, so you were able to resist the temptation, resist like having to be as flashy as the other dudes. Yeah. Because yeah, like just because of your your upbring up. Sorry, excuse me. Because of your upbringing. Yeah. Correct, correct, correct. Whatever, correct. Because I mean, just just by growing up like that, I knew that I knew I don't need to have uh, the newest car every year. I don't need it because, like, um, you get a lot of guys who say they, if they, um, if they're if it's if the year's 2012 and they driving a 2011, that's not acceptable. They're gonna trade that in and get hit across the head with paying a difference just to keep up with the newest version. Oh, I got the new set and sex. And some guys, on the other hand, like myself, I just get the new body style when it comes out, and then I will chill with that one for the seven or eight years that it's that same body. Right, right. That's actually very smart. Because people, only like real car aficionados are going to know the difference. Correct, correct. That's, that's the only thing that and most people don't. So, And then you got a, you got a whole bunch of guys that do that or whatever, and... At the end of the day, it, it really is the same vehicle. It just has a few cosmetic changes. Right, yeah. So 
Okay, so, I mean, you're very smart. And actually, the NFL should hire you to be one of those, like, former players to come in when they have those they have those sessions when, when rookies are drafted and, like, hey, guys, I know, I'm, sure, I'm sure they have, or maybe it's the NFLPA that does that and they have guys, you they know, coming in. It. Oh, they do. The Ricky Symposium, and they have invited me to talk to them a couple of times. I think I may go ahead and take them up on it. Whatever, yes. Because I was, I, I mean, like, first, at first I was saying, you know, like, these guys won't listen to me or whatever, but I mean, it, it, it's worth the try because, like, even when I was playing, I, I tried to talk to some of the younger guys about what they should do and shouldn't do. But uh, until you really, ex- like, most of these guys need to experience this stuff firsthand. They, they need this experience firsthand for them to realize, like, wow, I see they, I see they're for real. Right. Well, I mean, after this documentary, I'm sure it's opened a lot of people's eyes, and and hopefully, the younger generation will will now take uh, learn from the lessons of the past now a guy that's not hurting for money alex rodriguez i don't know if you saw this but during the alcs uh he got benched and then in between innings he he uh wrote on a baseball and he gave it to the ball boy and the ball boy threw it at two particular two girls like two uh that were two rows behind the yankees bay uh yankees um dugout and then one of the girls wrote her phone number the message was like hey let me get your number so then the girl wrote her phone number on it and then threw it back to the ball boy, and the ball boy delivered it to Alex Rodriguez. What's what's the mes- method that you saw most often used by teammates to get a lady's number during the game? <laughs> a trainer. <laughs> what you do, it's, it's sort of like the same thing. What they do is talk to a trainer. You tell them not to look. But this will only happen, like, during the preseason or whatever. Like, I don't know if any of my guys will do it during the regular season, but the preseason, they are like, look at that girl right there, and they'll probably give them something to go give to a fan. <laughs> I like I like how they tell the trainer not to look right away. Like, don't look, don't look. Yeah, they'll look right away, <laughs> and they'll probably get, like, a glove or a hat or something and tell them to go give it to most of the time if that person, if that, Person, uh, if that female is with a kid or another guy, whatever, they'd be like, "Go, um, give this person this, give it to that kid, and then get her phone number." Cause most of the time, I'm sure what he was saying, like you can tell, like they they basically can tell you with their eyes what the deal is. <laughs> so just, just find you somebody to, to go to go work the assist for you, right? And before you know it, you, you're. You're you're on sports center doing a highlight. <laughs> <laughs> so so that's awesome that the the trainers are the middlemen and the ball boys are the middlemen in yeah, uh, yeah, in the yeah. in the uh, MLB. Um, so uh, the funny thing is, hold on before you finish, they look forward to it. Like half the time, they'll come and tell you, say if there's a nice one that's looking at you or whatever. And oh. then I come tell you, they're like, oh, three. Hey, you see the girl right there in, in, in the first row in the pink shirt right there? You see her? Man, dude, she's undressing you. I oh, like that. see, I like that. So, like, you have, like, it's like messengers. Like, and I like how dudes are, uh, some dudes are, like, proactive. Like, yeah. they're going to get, yeah. they're, they're scouting the crowds for you. Then again, it, it comes down to knowing your guys, knowing who's single, knowing who's for all of that. Right, right. And then also, it's like, it's like you have to develop like the 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 trainer has to earn your trust to like because you the girl that he might point out in the pink may not be a girl that you think is as dope as the girl in the yellow, so I'm sure there's a little bit of that too. He already knows you guys already have that y'all already have that relationship. <laughs> were there any were there ever any teammates that had particularly challenging? Uh, I don't know, tastes in women, like, they just like some girls that were, like, really, really big or just had had a very, very unique style. And by unique, I mean not really that good looking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Give me yeah, one name. Those guys. Oh, man. You were just no, one name, no, Javon. I, I would not give you. Come on. <laughs> the statute of limitations is over. You've, you've, you're, you're three years removed from being in a locker room. You're, you're good now. You can say one name. Maybe it's from your rookie season. That's like ten years ago. I need one more. I, I need uh, a, another year. Another year. <laughs> <laughs> I will hit you back in October of 2013 with the same and question. I got you. I got you. My, you hit me up September of 2013. I got you. Perfect. Now I um 
I I saw you once. I used to cover. Um, I used to work on an, a basketball show, uh, and and once I saw you in Atlanta, 2003 NBA All Star Game, um, yeah. All Star Weekend, and you were just like walking through a hotel or whatever, and you had this pretty nice like throwback jersey on at the time when throwback jerseys were all the rage. Whatever yeah. happened to all of your throwback jerseys? Because at the time, athletes had like dozens and dozens and dozens yeah. of Mitchell and Ness throwback jerseys. I, see, I I have mine put up in the attic. I have mine folded up and taken care of in, in the attic. I'm going to keep them on. Um, um, actually, some of them I've gotten signed. Um, let me see. I got a I got an autograph Wilt Chamberlain. Oh, amazing. Uh, let me see. Which other ones? I got a, oh, I also have a autograph Buffalo Bills number 32. Oh, OJ. Like wow. That. Okay. Okay. That's cool. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I got down, but uh, really, um, I was like, when, when it came time to clean the group, to clean the, the closet out, to, to create more space. And I looked at my closet and I got like 20 plus throwback jerseys. I'm like, uh, should I give them away or should I? And I'm like, no, but these are great. These are, these are the greats. These are the guys that paved the way. These are the guys that's the pioneers, the guys that started it. So, I'm like, I can't throw these jerseys away. So I just fold them all up and I put them up. Eventually, uh, uh, I may put them in a, I may put them in a case, or I may try to get one of the autographs that I can. But yes, I, I, I you I still have, have them. Mine. And so you wait, yeah, you so you, so you have like about like twenty or so. So like you didn't, I mean that's a lot, but you didn't go like crazy where you had like I remember like Fabulous had like you know eighty or a hundred or he had yeah. like an insane amount. No, I didn't go crazy. I actually, I probably, I would say I probably bought um, half of them and the other halves were gifts. Oh, nice. Okay, okay. So, uh, on the phone with Javon Curse now, in your in your playing days, what event was a better party? Super Bowl week? I know you played in one Super Bowl, so obviously that one is not, that one's not valid, but um, maybe you, you've attended Super Bowl. So, Super Bowl week or NBA All-Star weekend? Which was a better party? I want to say Super Bowl week, <laughs> but th- yeah, I'm, I'm going to go with Super Bowl week or whatever. But I actually, I played in, in two Super Bowls. Oh, sorry, yeah, 2004. That. Excuse me, right? With the with, with yeah. you guys with the uh, against the Patriots. My bad. Uh, yeah, yeah, we were and we were also part of Spygate, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> right. I mean, hey, they could have been doing that then. Who? I mean, they only know, they only know, know about know, 2001. Right? For real. <laughs> so. uh <laughs> Oh, what are we talking about? <laughs> We're talking about which. What's a better party, Super Bowl week or NBA All Star oh, Weekend? Um, really? Yeah, um, Super Bowl week. Um, I mean, Super Bowl week. If you're not playing any game, whatever, because right, um, obviously, they, yes. Yeah, because they basically like. I mean, being up up on players, there they they let you in every party or whatever. And that's the biggest thing, being able to get in the parties and and having fun. So. But the NBA All Star, actually, I went to that one in Atlanta. I went to the one before that one. I think was in was in DC. Right. Yes. Yes. It, yeah. It was. So you've only I been to two. Is, yeah. Uh, yeah. Just two. Oh. Okay. I three. I've been to two or three. I want to say I went to one in Houston or whatever. Houston was two thousand six. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, um. Yeah, I think it was that, but um, I want to say, and also I met the most, like the most um, stars, probably at All Star at the basketball All Star. I hung out with Mike Tyson. That I was excited because I was only a rookie then when when I met Iron Mike. Wow. So what? Like what? Tell me about that night or that dinner. What was it? Well, we was at a club and we had just gotten in, and I was with my. Crew, <laughs> my crew. Up. Now, these are NFL players. These, this isn't like my friends back home. But I was, I was with my crew, and my friend happens to look. We think my friend looks like Mike Tyson, which is Fred Taylor. Oh no! I always say he looks like Mike, or whatever. So we actually uh, somebody went up to Mike, and they told Mike to, to go and to go and try to intimidate Fred. Like tell my buddy right there, I want you to go up to him and be like, "What's up? What you want to do?" Wow. So he walked so Mike Tyson walks up to my buddy Fred T and was like, What's up, man? What's up? How you doing? 
And Fred just looked at him like, what's up? I'm like, whoa. <laughs> Fred <laughs> just looked him up and down like, what's up? <laughs> and then Mike just started smiling, just started smiling like, man, he's like, man I like you, man. Me? He's like, me? I'm MT and you FT. <laughs> so wait, he didn't even back down. Like, did Tyson go like with no. that? Oh, he didn't. He just kind of said, "What's up?" He wasn't. He didn't go in with that one. You know, that iron grill where you, he looks yeah. right into your soul. He did. He oh. did. And for, well, no, it, no, it, it wasn't the same as he do it before the fights. But he tried to mimic it a little bit. But Fred, I think he knew what was going on. So Fred didn't back down a bit, and then Mike just started like smiling immediately, which was cool. It was very cool. Fred's got courage because I've I've interviewed Mike Tyson, and yeah. this is I interviewed Mike Tyson like this in like February at his house, like in his home in uh, Henderson, Nevada. And just looking at the dude in the eyes, I was like, I could feel fear. Like I could, and like it, there's only remnants left, but I can only imagine what it must have been like to be in the ring, looking across from Mike, like an absolute bulldog with rabies, just looking at you, like yeah. looking into your soul, and just about to tear that to bits. Like it was, I was, it was palpable. And I, I was a total little girl. I was like an eight year old girl looking at friggin', you know, Leatherface from the T Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'll get you out on this. Uh, Beyonce is the confirmed artist for this year's halftime show, show at the Super Bowl. Give me your favorite mm. Super Bowl performer from your that you've in your lifetime. I mean, I may be a little bit biased, but. I know a lot of people want me to say Janet Jackson or whatever, but um, <laughs> but, but that was but you know that's Janet. She has that. Personally, I'm gonna say it was Tina Turner. Wow, she what year was that? See, that was the Super Bowl, the the Titan Super Bowl I played in back in '99, 2000. That oh, was okay, Tina I'm, Turner. Wasn't she like 70 at that point? That's why I want to say this because we got the chance to meet her the day before the game. And wow, that's I mean that's like, a legend right there. She's like Hall of Fame, is. like in a spe in a special wing of the Hall of Fame. Tina Turner. Listen, she just she just looked so nice. I don't know how old she might have been, probably in her sixties at that point. But she just her body looked she she looked so good. She looked so, <laughs> and, and she's also my sister's my younger sister. She's her favorite artist, or whatever. Because I mean my little sister. Running around the house singing, what's love got to do with it? Like all day long. And then when I saw her, I did take a picture with her and gave them to give to my sister, whatever. But just seeing her, she had looked so good for that age. I know she was like old enough to be my grandmother, but she still just looked at just wow, just shot this breathtaking for the be that age. Wow, Tina Turner. I did not expect you to say that. I mean, yeah. Janet Jackson is a is a popular. Answer, I think uh, some people might say, Bruce, I think Bruce Springsteen did one recently. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, but Tina Turner, nice. You just went with the legends. As you've been saying, you have a bunch of legends, legendary jerseys in your attic. You get to meet Correct. a legendary, and you show some love to a legendary performer in Tina Turner. And oh, yeah. uh, it was my pleasure to speak to you, Javon. You are a legend to me. And, uh, you know, your highlights and your your skills on the field were, were unmatched. So I thank you for joining me on uh on the radio show, man. My pleasure. Thanks for allowing me to be a legend, and thanks for allowing me to be on your show as well. My pleasure, dude. Hey, so listen, September 2013, we're gonna have you back on Cabby Presents. All right. And I'm gonna do. And I'm gonna give you some names on, on everything. <laughs> perfect, Javon. Perfect. Thanks again for joining me, man. No problem. He played in Super Bowl 34 with the Titans against the Rams in Super Bowl 39 against the Patriots, with the Eagles, as we discussed, and embodied freakishly athletic and talented athletes. I love that conversation, so thank you for that, Javon. Another specimen that played in Super Bowl 35 for Seattle, but now wears the baby blue, red, and white of the Tennessee Titans at the position of safety, has a very interesting story, and joins me on the phone right now. If it's going to be uh, an interview, I'm going to conduct it. So I'll answer my own questions, ask myself the questions, then give y'all the answers. And on the line, to say this man 
uh, is athletic is like saying LeBron James has a giant forehead. Uh, ladies and gentlemen from the Tennessee Titans. <laughs> Uh, uh, what an intro. I know, right? Uh, Jordan Babineau from the Tennessee Titans uh, is on the phone. Thank you so much for uh, for being here, man. Have you um, have you been to Toronto before? I know you're in Tennessee or you're in Nashville. No, man. No, Toronto is, is, is a place that I've, you know, I need to make some kind of effort to get up that way. I hear great things about the city. Have you been to Canada at all? Vancouver. I've only been in Vancouver. I spent seven years in Seattle, so... Earlier in my career, I had a, you know a few opportunities to head up north above the, above the border and uh, enjoy my time there. Now, uh, speaking of uh, uh, you know north of the border, uh, I was texting uh, a former uh, college uh, teammate of yours, uh, and I said to him, "I'm like, I'm just going to say his name, and I just want to see, I just want to hear your reaction." So when I say to you, Nick Lewis, what do you what what comes to mind? Oh man, you know. He, he's, I mean, I hear nothing but good things about Nick and, and the career that he's had in Canada. And, uh, you know, a, a lot of times here, you know, players tend to still think that they're, 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 that they're at their school. So we have a, a college competition all the time, especially around college season. You know, so guys guys give me grief about where, where I went to school. And I was like, you guys want to talk all that noise, but they're, they're, we still have professional athletes now that's other than me. And they think I'm the only professional player that went to Southern Arkansas. But I always tell them about Nick Lewis up in Canada, man, a guy who, who's had an amazing career. And I think, uh, you know, when he's done, probably be in the Canadian Football League Hall of Fame. Yeah, he is Nick Lewis. Uh, he plays for the Calgary Stampeders. And uh, he always ha- he puts together like these great seasons. I don't know if you know, but Nick has developed like eight different personalities. He has got these eight different personas. I can't remember their names. But do oh, you was he like? I know you you've played with a bunch of different characters, some bigger than life. Um, now, where where would what do you remember about Nick's personality when you guys were on campus or playing at uh, Southern Arkansas University? It was just as big as you're talking about, <laughs> everything about him. But, but saying that too, I mean, the guy was like he was, he was. Uh, I, I would say, com- like he had a, a competitive humbleness about himself, if you will. But you know, he he knew what his worth was. You know, I mean, there, his competitive edge uh, was was not to be wavered by uh, you know his height, his his position, and and you know, and his size as a receiver. But I tell you what, you throw that ball in the air, he's going to go get it. So, okay, uh, yeah, I, and I, I'm with you on that. Uh, on the phone with Jordan Babineau of the Tennessee Titans, I was uh, I grew up a, a Titans fan because I used to watch Eddie George uh, play at The Ohio State, and then he got drafted by the uh, Houston Oilers, and I became a Titans fan. So there's a little uh, there's a little bit of fanboy in me. Um, and I, so, okay, so that's just the, that that's just an aside. Um, I wanted to ask you about okay, you know Questlove of the Roots, the drummer from the Roots. Yeah, yeah. So, so to to people who are a little unfamiliar with Questlove, he's now the the roots are the house band uh, for Jimmy Fallon's show. Anyway, Questlove is teaching a course at NYU called Classic Albums at the uh, Tisch School of the Arts. So, in, and so, and, and among these classic albums are like Led Zeppelin's Four, uh, Prince's Dirty Mind, Michael Jackson's Off the Wall. In your mind, what makes an album classic to you, Jordan? Wow, you're, you're talking maybe about four or five number one hits. Uh, you know, over its 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 period of time, you're talking about you know something that not only moves uh, a specific culture, but something that can touch you know uh, one a, a multitude of cultures. You know, I'm, I'm speaking of demographic, and also a multitude of generations. You know, you start talking about uh, you know people like Prince, uh, you know uh, artists like. Uh, the Temptations, uh, Luther Vandross, uh, uh, people like Frankie Beverly and Mays, and, and, and classic artists, you know, who, who who music still exists as if it was made yesterday. Michael Jackson, you know, those type of artists, you know, have created, uh, you know, that that type of of of, of image when you're talking about uh, album. That's classic, and, and it, it, you hear it today, and it's like they just made it yesterday. But the album's thirty, forty years old. Off the top of your head, can you what like what albums jump out to you as classic albums? Oh, without a doubt, uh, Thriller. Right. Um, you now, know, um, 
uh, you know, I, I was, I was, I'm big time Al Green fan. Um, you know, um, but which which Al Green record? Because let's, I don't think let's stay together and uh, oh my gosh, let's stay together and what was that? See, I have the Al Green's greatest hit, so that's him on the cover with no shirt on. Like that's the right, iconic right, right. image and, and, of Al Green. And I can just you can press play on that. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You know, you talk you talk about you know uh, artists like Prince. I'm, I'm I'm listening to Donny Hathaway just yesterday, man, and I tell you, I'm like wow, like I'm moved. Uh, a move by by the lyrics and the music and the songs. It's 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 that good. Okay. That good. Now, um, you know when you um, is it okay? So I have this. I've had this argument with my my friends. I can, this is kind of a tough question to ask you, but can you think of an artist or a group whose best album was their third record or beyond? Because there's. If you if you look back at a multitude of artists, their best work is either their first record or their second record. I mean, you mentioned Michael Jackson. First solo record was Off the Wall. The second was Thriller. Like, y- you go one or two right there for, for his, and he's had a huge body of work. But then you have oh, Bad, man. which is good. Then you have Black or White. And then you have you Invincible. I know, that's a, it's a t- no, Jordan, I, but I know you're a man with a lot of knowledge in music. I heard it. You, Donny Hathaway, Frankie Beverly Mays, Al Green. I know Luther. <laughs> it's funny that you mentioned Luther, too. That's awesome. So I know you, you have a roots in, in soul and R&B, like as far as what you listen to. Okay, so I know it's a tough question, but can you think of an artist or, or, uh, or, or group that's their, their best album was their third record or beyond? Their third record or beyond. Wow, man, that that is really tough. I mean, if I don't know, I, I really I can't think of the only the only person or group that I can think of whose image has continued to grow. And I, I'm gonna bring you a little bit more into my and in, 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 in my uh, uh, outcast. Oh, you know, that, 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 wow, that's a, that, that's a group that comes to mind right off the top. Right, because um, their, fir- their first one was a Southern Playalistic, right? Yeah, yeah, and then and, it- and, and, and they only got better. They did AT Aliens, man. And then it was Aquemini, uh, right? Was Aquemini the third it, one? You know, you know, so whether AT Aliens or Aquemini was the second or third album, you know, those those were good albums. Oh, absolutely. Those oh, are, man. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh man. The the, uh, the one I, the one I that so I much music too on oh, my iPod is ridiculous. I know, and, and I can't think of anything right now. I wish what, I had it. In front of <laughs> once you get off the phone, you'd be like, you probably have like eight of them just pop into your head. I know. It I always know, happens like fair. that. The only one that I could think of, like when I when I was. The one that I go to is either Jay Z. A lot of people have reasonable doubt as his best one or Volume One. I think, like, as far as a whole record, I think the Black Album is probably the best one. But it, that's it's it's totally subjective, and that's my and right, and the other one is right. Usher's Confessions, which uh, that was like his biggest record, and that was his third his third album. So that was like th- those those are the two that I go to. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, those those are very very uh, good selections too. So okay, so uh, Donald Trump always seems to make his way into the news somehow. Good, like whether it's him tweeting or whether it's him saying something absolutely ridiculous about the president of the United States, Barack Obama. But recently, he tweeted about the relationship between Robert Pattinson and Kristen Stewart, who were the uh, they're the stars. You know, the Twilight movies with the vampires and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you do you think that Donald Trump should stick to making real estate deals or continuing? Or continue to make us laugh inadvertently with the ridiculousness he puts out on Twitter. Hey, well, Donna, I'll tell you what. I, I, one of the, one of the I read a book called Four Day Laws of Power. All right, and one one of the, one of the laws was if you want to, want to catch fish, you got to stir up waters. <laughs> I tell you what, Donald Trump, man, he's a smart man now. You know, and he, I think he understands exactly what what all that entails. You know, and his, the way he does it is, is probably, you know you know, least thought of or, or something that you wouldn't expect from, you know, a Donald Trump type figure, you know, but, but the man is, he's always found himself to, to, to be a part of, of multi-million dollar deals and, and, and be a part of uh, an image that everyone tends to uh, somewhat duplicate. Now, Trump was recently in, uh, he was invited into the New England Patriots locker room after the uh, Patriot, uh, excuse me, the Patriots, uh, they won a game. Who's the most famous person to ever walk into either to any locker room that you've uh, been a member of? Paul Allen, man. What you wow. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. That's that's he. He's more, he's more rich than Donald Trump. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, you know, what's crazy is that you know the whole time playing in Seattle, I got to learn some interesting facts about him. 
And uh, one of the things that stuck out with me is Paul Allen has more money than all of the 31 owners combined. Are you serious? <laughs> Are you thinking about that for a minute? <laughs> yeah, I'm, like my head can't even wrap around that kind of math. Oh, man, that's crazy. Now that, like, and, and he seems to be just sort of a... I mean, not as nebbish as, as, uh, as uh, oh, my gosh, um, how am I forgetting uh, Bill Gates? Oh, my goodness. But, yeah. it, but, but Paul Allen is not like a bigger-than-life guy like Jerry Jones or Donald no. Trump. You're like, no. He's just a normal dude wearing you know, Bill Cosby sweaters. That's yeah, pretty amazing. Yeah, that, he, he, he pretty much takes his private jet over to France just about three times a month, that kind of thing. The other, the other thing I remember, too, is when uh, Jim Moore was the head coach, he brought in uh, Bill Russell to speak to us, and I got a chance to, uh, to you know, to kind of meet him, meet and greet him. So that was that was pretty special. Did Bill let you take a photo with him? Believe it or not, he did. And you know what's crazy is because I hear nothing but, but bad stories, not even bad stories, but more so, you know, he's over that. You know, he's, he's had, he, he's had his, his expressions with fans as far as, you know, being being uh, conversational and, and things like that. And crazy enough, he did. But what, what what's also funny is that Bill he lives in he lives up in Seattle, and sometimes he plays golf at the uh, at the golf course up there at Newcastle. And so I see him out there playing by himself. I don't say much to him. I just see him, at, you know, and nod and let him go about his business. But Bill know, Russell he, lives in Seattle. Yeah. No oh, doubt. wow. <laughs> yeah. Nobody will know after this. Um, so I, I recently heard uh, Jalen Rose is, a, is a now an analyst or has been an analyst, an NBA analyst on ESPN for, I don't know, maybe four or five years. He's an unbelievable storyteller, one of the best storytellers in the business. And he was recently telling a story about when he was on the Toronto Raptors and the game, playing in the game in which Kobe Bryant scored 81 points. Now, in the NBA, there are two schools of fandom. You're either a Kobe guy or a LeBron guy. Which guy are you, Jordan? I'm neither, man. Michael Jordan, man. Don't forget the inventor. Okay, fine. Okay. <laughs> you, can't, you can't just go right to the top of the mountain, Jordan. Okay, obviously, MJ is, the, is, you know, he's on the Mount Everest, excuse me, the Mount Rushmore of greatest basketball players ever. But I'm talking about, like, cur- current day, your contemporaries, your peers right. as professional athletes, Kobe or LeBron. Oh man, I'm a I'm a I'm a LeBron fan. You're a LeBron I'm really, guy. I'm I'm taking LeBron over Kobe. For any, I, what, I, what's... I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm particularly biased about the Kobe Shaq situation. So. <laughs> oh, so wait, what, explain that. What does that what mean? mean? You, you mind? You know how to, you know you know the whole thing about that and the whole Kobe and Shaq fall off. And yeah, after, yeah, and then Shaq left. Yeah, so, what, and what Kobe you know, said. Yeah, that, but 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 trust me, that that certainly doesn't take anything away from all Kobe's, uh, Kobe's accomplishments and things like that. But, you know, if I had a choice and you're giving me a choice, so I'm taking LeBron. All right. Well, there you go. The, uh, Jordan Babin of the Tennessee Titans on uh, Team LeBron. Okay, so I have a couple more. So there was a recent uh, NBA GM uh, GM's poll, and uh, I'll give you these four categories. The NBA Finals champion. You uh, uh, Give me who you predict, and I'll tell you who, what, who the NBA GM's. Did you see this poll? No, I haven't. I okay. haven't. I've been, you know, I'm, I've only been able you're... to catch the few highlights of it. You know, I'm over here. We're talking football right now. That's it's, fair. It's worth all That's, fair. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. That's fair, Jordan. You know, of course, you know, I, I, I wouldn't imagine anything less than everyone, uh, uh, you know, w- without a doubt, someone having the same teams that, 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 you know, seems to be obvious. You know, the Lakers, obviously, are going to be in the topic of conversation. Uh, Oklahoma City is going to be topic of conversation. Um, and then, you know, Chicago. You know, teams teams like like that. So uh, Miami certainly uh, have an op- another chance and opportunity to 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 uh, repeat. So you know, if anybody, I probably I probably say that the majority of of of, uh, of people would say that it would be a, a Lakers Miami finals. So they so the the GM poll was there. Seventy percent believe that the Lakers will. Sorry, seventy percent believe that the Heat will win, and twenty percent believe that the Lakers will win. I want to stay in Los Angeles for a second with you, Jordan, because you have a very interesting story. I didn't know that you and your brother have an interest in films, in filmmaking in Los Angeles, oh, obviously, is, yeah. the, is the epicenter of, of films in North America and, and maybe, maybe globally in Hollywood. And uh, it's interesting because Steve Nash also has a production company, and 
a lot of, and and you know it's been rumored that Dwight Howard has interests in wanting to act in films. Okay, so let me put that aside. Now, I want to, with you and your brother Justin, you guys have a, 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 a film company. You guys have actually released a movie. Now, I know football is a totally different set of skills. How, like, how much different was it trying to get the financing, hire the crew, like all those uh, pieces, put those pieces together to actually produce and release a film? Well, we have... We've done three projects uh, as of as of now. Uh, our first project um, was Kevin Hart, seriously funny. He's oh, um, you guys did that? Cleveland. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that yeah, was that, unbelievable. Say yeah, it with that your was, chest, that and was, that was the one that took him to the next level. Yes, it was. Say it with you your know, chest, and like uh, before laughing, yeah, that like before laughing my pain. Right, and and, it, and that. Mm-hmm. Sorry, sorry to cut you off. The the I just get excited because I've seen Kevin Hart live, and I I was just watching. Uh, uh, um, no, uh, something. Oh my gosh, what was his last one? The, the last one was laughing my pain. Laughing my pain, and but the one that you guys yeah. did, the one we did was seriously funny. Seriously you know, funny. That's, that's maybe about three or four years. You know, that's the one he, he, he talks about his uncle and <laughs> you know, has, uh, say it with your chest. Yeah, and uh, and uh, the the joke about uh, the UFC fighters, like. Real yeah, yeah. all day, <laughs> just me by yeah, myself. By yeah, myself. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. That one. So you guys so, produced that that uh, concert film. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. No, we're executive producers, and I'll explain to you. I, I, I'll tell you about that in a second. The second project we did was uh, Mike Epps and Friends. He presented uh, live from Club Nokia. We did that one. That was another one that did DVD. And then uh, our, our more recent uh, project, biggest project to date, um, was the. TD, we teamed up with T.D. Jakes, uh, the T.D. Jakes brand, and we executive produced his Woman Bower Loose on the Seventh Day, uh, which starred Blair Underwood and Sharon Lill. Oh, wow. And, um, that, one, that, one was, uh, that one was really, really nice to see. Uh, we, we, my brother and I had a chance to go on set. They filmed that one in New Orleans, so it, it was good to see a little behind-the-scenes um, acting and you know everything that goes into it. Um, but with that being said, our, our involvement uh, came about with a partnership with Cold Black Enterprises, who, who at the time had a uh, had a, a partnership with with Universal, and and now uh, you know three years later, uh, parted ways with Universal, and, and so our distribution deal is is, is under the brand of um, um, I thought you made me go blank. Um, Lionsgate. Okay. Right? Yeah. 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 Lionsgate. So, so we've we've certainly made some strides over the past three years, and and uh, you know, Code Black and, and Jeff Klan again, and those guys have have really made um, you know this this whole venture into this 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 new uh, order of business for us uh, very simple for us, and and it's been more of a turnkey type process for us, um, with with most of them doing some of the the actual. Uh, task that entails of a producer, you know, as far as getting the cast, getting the crew, managing the money, uh, you know, set, things like that. So, um, you know, for me and for my brother, uh, we, we, we have a, a, a real interest in it because we, we've certainly been a part of it. Um, with that being said, the NFL also launched a, a pro Hollywood football uh, boot camp this this past off season, what I, which I had to be a part of, so I, I had a chance to uh, to work with Robert Townsend, um, you know, at, at Universal, and uh, we actually produced our own short film, and uh, that was that was real special because we were hands on, got to experience what it was like to be a producer. I actually did a little acting. All right, there you have, go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get mean, your Blair Underwood on. Yeah, you know, well, it's, I'm telling you, man, that's that's a whole different set of emotions that I really had to tap into that, you know, you, you really got to dig, dig for those because every time you shoot a scene, it has to be as authentic and, 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 and as organic as it was if this was the first one. So that was, that was the toughest challenge for me, but it was real fun. So wait, okay. So I, again, I'm on the phone with Jordan Babineau of the Tennessee Titans, him and his brother, Justin have a production company have, and have been, uh, in the role of executive producer on several projects, the most recent one, uh, shooting with uh, uh, Blair Underwood in the title role. I'm sorry, what was the what was the name of the film again? Woman Thou Art Loose. Woman Thou Art Loose. Yeah, it's a, it's a T.D. Jakes film. T- uh, okay. Woman Thou Art Loose. 
on the seven day. So, so Jordan, this particular, this last thing you were talking about, Robert Townsend, who was a, uh, you know, who had a, who was a famous. He had his, he had a, a cult classic called Hollywood Shuffle. I want to say in like eighty six, eighty seven ish. He was of, you know, he came up with, yeah. uh, with uh, the Wayans you know, brothers. You know came up movie, with Arsenio. You know that he made like that movie. You know that he he made that movie on credit card uh, credit card loans. Wow. Yeah, he told us the story, man. It was crazy. Hollywood Shuffle. Yeah. He made that movie on credit card loans. I'm not kidding you. Whether yeah. it was gas, uh, clothing, things like that, you know, whatever whatever it was and, and how he did it, he, he got it done. That used to be the way that it. a lot of independent filmmakers had to finance their movies. Spike Lee was the same thing when he did She's Gotta Have Not She's Gotta Have It. Um, Do the right thing. No, before that, his uh, very it's the one with his character Mars Blackman, who's maybe it was she's got to have it. I think it was. It was in black and white. He he's saying he used credit card debt to finance. Okay, so you just did some back. Where can 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 fans see this this short film that you did at this NFL camp? I think that the NFL has exclusive rights to it, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, they they showed it at the uh, at one of the film festivals in Miami. But I, I don't believe that it's you know that you can put it up on YouTube because you know I, I mean there's there's some ex- exclusivity rights and things right. like that. I'm not sure all the things that, that that went into it, but they did give us a copy of it. It was it was pretty fun. It was pretty special, man. There there are, there are a number of guys who participated, and I want to say 20 uh, retired and current players, and uh, man the, the the cast and and the people who uh, who gave us their time was was uh, it was. Certainly, it, it was it was mind blowing, man. I was I was blown away with, with with the workshops and the workload and the things that really went into it. And now I have a whole deal of respect and a better understanding, uh, you know, and, and how I watch movies and 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 you know, look at what the you know the pro- producer is trying, the story he's trying to tell, uh, the things that he's trying to tell, and and you know the the, the, the tactics and the, and the, and the things that go into. Uh, telling the story and keeping your audience engaged. So that wait, so the NFL. Okay, I just want I just want to be clear. The NFL has for people that are interested in perhaps like you know entertainment as you know, ha, has an interest in entertainment or some perhaps as a, as a second career. The NFL has camps so where that that align you with Hollywood producers or Hollywood uh, executives so that you can make your own short movies. Is oh that, yeah, is that oh, yeah. right? It's, it's, yeah, yeah. It's this was the first time that the that the uh, the Hollywood boot camp, um, you know, came about. Uh, in the past, I participated in the broadcast boot camp, which was also uh, you know really special to see. I got you know spent some time with Kirk Menefee, James Brown, uh, affiliates with ABC, Fox, NFL Network, and uh, HBO. Um, that was that was uh, you know a good experience. And then again, they also tapped into a music boot camp, you know, for current players and, and retired players. So there, there's been some opportunities that the NFL um, uh, player development has allowed players to tap into other things uh, off the field and, and kind of express themselves in, in, in that kind of form. But there's also an application process. So you can imagine, you know, there's 100 or 200 applicants each time that, that, that this is offered. So, and they only select in 20. Um, so, you know, the competition process is, is, is certainly, uh, you know, something that, that was, you know, handpicked uh, when you start talking about the people and the participants who were a part of it. But it was, it, was, it was well worth it, man. I enjoyed every minute of it. Now, Jordan, as you and your brother continue to obviously play uh, football in the NFL and then down the road continue to produce these uh, produce films or work on projects, what is the dream project? And what le- is it like... Do you want to do like a like a like a franchise like Harry Potter, or are you going to do like a movie like The Notebook where like everybody's crying, or are you going to have like a a runaway comedy hit like The Hangover or something like that? What's the dream well, project? Or are you going to be like Indiana would, Jones where dudes are just having this crazy adventure all over the planet? I would I would imagine. I mean, there there are a number of things that you know that you know that can be available for both my brothers. We really haven't had a chance to talk about it. Like some of the things and the ideas and the projects that we get are pretty, I mean, they're, they're already formed. Like the script is already ready. Um, so now it's just about finding the cast, uh, setting, you know, setting up the dates and, and shoot locations and things like that. But, you know, uh, we, we have a, a, a pretty good relationship with, with the Kevin Hart business. 
um, you know, and, and, and tend to favor more of the urban comedy uh, uh, genre of, 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 of music, I mean, of, of movies. Of movies, right. Um, but, but I would imagine that our, our dream project would somewhat be a story of uh, my brother and I and, and the things that we had to endure to get to the places that we've, uh, where we come from. So, um, you know, that's, that's something in the making. Um, and, and, you know, we'll continue to do these projects as, as long as they make sense. Uh, and the biggest thing about them is, is, is that uh, for us, uh, our distribution deal with Lionsgate uh, makes these projects far less risky. So, uh, I mean, I mean as, as, as far as us being able to, uh, you know, manage and fund our own films um, is, is kind of where we see what makes the most sense when we start talking about investments. That's awesome. And, and you know what? Speaking of investments, do you still have Paul Allen's phone number? <laughs> No, I never did. I oh never did. man, well, you, you, he's, he's probably only one one uh, degree of separation from you. So you like you need to re rekindle that relationship. Whether it's like you know the occasional text message or you know whenever you're up there, take the dude out for dinner. Because as you said, that guy is more rich than all the other 31 NFL owners combined. Yeah, that's a true statement, man. True statement. I'm just trying to help you out, sir. I know it. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> and I know a lot of people appreciate you. And certainly I do as a fan of the Tennessee Titans and all the people that you and your brother will employ as you work on these projects in the future uh, in the entertainment biz. It was, uh, man, it's, it was great talking to you. It's my first time uh, uh, getting to speak with you, and that was awesome. I, I, uh, you know what? Just a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to, I don't know if you're familiar with Tory Hunter, but he plays with the Anaheim Angels. And. And uh, he was discussing that after his career, him and a group of guys are going to try to own a team. So it's great hearing stories about athletes that, you know, that aren't just fully consumed with their sport, but they have a plan afterwards. Because a lot of guys probably don't have a plan. And it seems like you and your brother, Justin, are, are, are well on, on your way. So it's great to learn that about you, Just uh, Jordan. Good, man. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it, guys. i got to run the meetings. Okay, man. Great to talk to you. Thank you again. All right. Thank you. On Twitter, you can find him at Jordan Babineau. That's J-O-R-D-A-N-B-A-B-I-N-E-A-U-X. Jordan Babineau. Very cool story, and I'm confident that you'll see his work off the field very soon. That NFL producer camp sounds awesome and a great opportunity for players to get a start on a second career. That's I didn't know about that, so it was a cool little nugget to um, to discover. Closing out the show. The main event. Although he recently suited up in what looks like a Bumblebee costume or Bumblebee jersey, has played uh, all his years in Pittsburgh, and he just missed out on playing Jordan Babineau in Super Bowl thirty-five when it was Seattle versus Pittsburgh. But he did win Super Bowl forty-three, the most exciting Super Bowl game I've ever seen. I met him last year in New York, and I was so annoying... He remembered me. If it's going to be uh, an interview, I'm going to conduct it. So I'll answer my own questions, ask myself the questions, then give y'all the answers. Proudly repping the blue and gold of the Michigan Wolverines, but putting in a ton of work wearing the black and yellow for the Pittsburgh Steelers. One of the baddest dudes to play defense in the NFL joins me now. Lamar Woodley, welcome to Cabby Presents. Hey, man, how you doing? Thanks for having me on. How does it feel to be described as one of the baddest? Uh, I mean, that, that's a great thing. You know, that, that, that goes to show all the work that I've been putting in and uh, all the work that, you know, I still have to put in, you know, to be to, for you to be saying that being that this is only my sixth year in the league. That, but, like, I can't say you're the baddest because I've seen you smile before. Hey, yeah, it's all right to smile every now and then. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's, Hey, all, hey, all linebackers can't say they can smile and have nice teeth. Oh, that's very, very <laughs> true. Very true. Now, uh, uh, you've, uh, you've made it into pop culture. This is awesome. You're, you're with your appearance on South Park. You've crossed over from football into the, like, animation to the realm where everybody can, uh, uh, can see you. How did you find out that you were going to be on an episode of South Park? Uh, actually, I found out, uh, I met the producer, Frank, uh, um, in the summertime, and we do, you know, um, we talked about it, and you know, he said, "I'm see if I'm gonna be able to get you on the episode." I'm like, "Cool," you know, um, try to get me on there. And once they got me on there, I was like, "Hey, I'm on South Park. I didn't have to say no speaking lines or anything like that." But <laughs> the point is, it said Lamar Woodley, you know, and I, and I was on South Park, so 
lot of people in his locker room can't say he was on South Park. I don't think anybody in that locker room can say that. I, like, I, I don't know if any football player has been on that show. <laughs> hey, I was on there, so that that was a great that was a great that was a great look for me. Not, yeah, absolutely. So, wait, did they have to get your permission to to say your name? No, I think actually being that it's uh that it's animation or whatever, um, they don't really have to really have to have your permission. But um, I gave them my permission anyways to. Um, to, to use my name because that's something that I, I want to do. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, so so continuing on the TV theme, which TV show would you like to make an appearance in as either you, Lamar Woodley, or as a as another character, and you have like a like a, a role and a storyline in the show? Uh, man, one of my favorite all time show is um, Law and Order. Oh, so, uh, I, and actually, I had the opportunity to be on the set of Law and Order uh, probably about four years ago, but I didn't I didn't make an appearance, but. Uh, I definitely would like to make an appearance on uh, Law and Order. That's always been one of my favorite shows, and uh, I watch it every day. Would you be like a guest DA, or like would you be like the prosecutor that comes, like the badass prosecutor from you, you know, know? You know, the main. I don't gotta. I don't need a big role. It can be something small. Like, <laughs> hey, you, did you see what happened? You know, I could be the person. You know, they interview like, yeah, I seen what happened. Like, oh, right, right. I you, can be... you know, I ain't acting for a big part. <laughs> I take small roles. You know, I ain't acting to be the star. You'll take you'll take one of the eyewitness roles. Exactly. You know, I'd be you know I'd be one of the um, <laughs> like you said in the courtroom or something. I can be the judge. You know, I can <laughs> why would I'm why not be the judge? Yeah, that'd be a great role for you. But then, and when you hit the gavel on the thing, you might it might explode because you're really strong. Yeah, you know, just just give me a little small role. Sorry. <laughs> So, so you like by playing okay so you're playing in the city with the richest football history uh the pittsburgh steelers have six championships not that it needed a boost but you guys got a huge boost from when, when uh, wiz khalifa had his hit song black and yellow about the steelers now due to your size and your stature you're a very visible dude in that city how does tipping work for you lamar how does what work tipping like when you go to restaurants and eat dinner with your friends or your family or your or whomever, how does tipping work for you? And uh, being that you said about black and yellow, I was in that video as well. You were know? you actually? Yeah, hey, man, I've, I've been in about two or three videos too. What were the other ones? Uh, I was in a DJ drama video, Oh My. <laughs> <laughs> I was sitting on, the, sitting on the couch with Kevin Hart, uh, DJ drama, and Roscoe Dash. Oh, that's and, and awesome. Was fabulous, yeah. So, okay, well, and what was so okay? So, so the DJ drama video. You're what were you doing in black and yellow? I gotta look, now. I gotta go YouTube the video to watch closer. Black, yeah, it was so. I, it was a quick scene. You know, I was only in there for about two seconds. Ah, uh, okay. And, um, actually, I was on a scene. We was on top of the building, but I kind of, I kind of stayed in the back. I didn't come up front because we were on top of a building. So <laughs> and you're afraid of heights. And grab me. <laughs> yeah, because if you slip over the edge, I don't know. Only like Thor or the Hulk would be able to grab you and pull you back uh, to safety. Exactly. So you know, I made a little few cameo appearances, but um, no, I mean tipping when I go out. I mean, I tip if the serve is good. You know, I make sure that you know the, the waitress, um, you know, earn earn their fair share. You so, know, because you know we're gonna we're gonna treat the, the the waiters and the people that work there with respect, and you know when they when they treat us with the same respect, and you know that, that they're doing everything, they're they're doing their job, and I make sure that they're tipped well because I know that they work hard and they don't make as much, you know. But Lamar, what okay, what is it like living with the expectation to be a great tipper because you're famous? Uh, no, 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 it's no expectation with me. Well, I know, but other people th have these expectations of you. I mean, you may not have that of yourself, but like, right. you know, but you're famous. So then people are like, oh, he's when famous. As far as when I go to a restaurant, though? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like I if they're doing their job, <laughs> if they do what they're supposed to do, you get tipped on your service. So if you have great service, then you'll get a great tip. Okay. But if you have bad service, you're still going to get a tip, but it's not going to be as good as it. You know, good. It could have been if you did a great job. Right. Okay. 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 So, for example, I have, I have this conversation with my friends all the time because I have I have a crew of eight dudes, and yeah. like some dudes are remarkably cheap. Some dudes are like in the middle, average, and other dudes like almost have to like make up for the dudes that are really cheap, especially when we're in a big group. So, if the bills say you're out for ice cream or whatever, and uh, or maybe not ice cream, I don't know, some some dessert place, and the bill is thirty two bucks. Right. What kind of tip do you leave? I mean, thirty-two dollars. Do you do you round up to the next like? I mean, even... honestly, I don't really tip on the ice cream. Okay, I fine. Mean... <laughs> okay, you so know, you're that's, up... that's like the guys in the bathroom that take the paper towels out, and you got to tip them because they yeah. turn the water. Oh, on them, doesn't that suck some sometimes? And you get your paper towel. <laughs> I'm like, come on, man! I gotta give you a dollar. I was gonna do that anyway. <laughs> 
You're absolutely right. Okay, okay. So if the Bills, okay, say the Bills, maybe you're at a pancake, maybe you're at a brunch place or something, and you have, right. okay, so the Bills, 32 bucks. Okay, for that's the example. What kind of tip do you leave? And then the service is pretty good. Well, basically, I mean, everybody's going to leave their own tip then. You know what I'm saying? That would be an individual thing. So I will leave my tip in my spot. It might be, you know, bill $32 and, you know, the waitress might have, you know, did a great job. You know, I might leave anywhere from 5 to $10. Okay. So, okay. So you're kind of in the, you're sort of like an average, you're like a, a normal tipper. You're not like. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because it depends on how much food she had to bring, you know, <laughs> if, she, if she's, because sometimes you go to a breakfast place and they, they they bring water out, but then they don't come back, you know, so right. they're constantly making sure you, you got water, is everything okay, you need more syrup or, you know, you need more food. <laughs> nah, that's what I like. They're constantly checking on you, making sure that. That you know that you serve well. I like and so and some of those like listen. I'm from Canada, so our portions aren't quite as large as they are in the United States. And right. some of those breakfast spots, man, they are huge platters of food. Like you get the hash browns and the and the huge pancakes. Like they're like the server is working for her money or his money. Like it's it's they're sweating by the end by the time it's two o'clock. Like you guys have a lot of food, is what I'm saying. Yeah, they definitely serve a lot. I go to IHOP a lot, so you oh know, yes, all, the IHOP. You know, they make sure that they take care of you. So okay, so okay, mo- moving on. There, there's like there's so many different ways that people exercise these days. Like you know, a lot of normal people like myself, they you know, people are into like the circuit training, the plyometrics, the P90X is very popular. Insanity is very popular. Uh, I remember a few years ago, Eddie George, who went to the Ohio State. I'm only saying that because you're a Michigan guy. Uh, he used yoga in his tra- training to help with his flexibility. Have you ever tried hot yoga? You know what? I was looking into doing that. Um, it's so hard, dude. On Thursday. I was I was looking to do it like on Thursday, but they said you got to go early in the week because it, you know, so hot in there, you get dehydrated. So I didn't want to. I didn't want to be dehydrated and have to go out there and play on Sunday. So was that? Would that have been the first time you tried it? Yeah, I haven't. I haven't tried it yet, dude. I uh, Lamar. I just went on the weekend. Like it is, and it's. It, I don't know if there's a form of exercise that's more humiliating than hot yoga because you're in a room. It's filled with women. You know, there's a lot of weird, unattractive breathing sounds. You don't know the moves. And then, like, you know, you're sweating like you got dosed, like got doused by, like, high school girls at a car wash. It's like, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's really, so, so, so I, I'm going to, it's, it's very, it's more challenging than you think. And then you got to hold the pose and then your core muscles are like, dude, I was shaking because I'm fat and I don't have a strong core. Yours is probably like, you could probably move a car with yours, but it's harder than it looks. So just, and go for the 60 minute, not the 90 minute. Just to, uh, as I'm a, at, I'm, at, I'm definitely have to get out to try. And, and the thing is, I went with a woman. Okay. And it's, there's always these things that dudes do for women. Like, and I don't know. What's the strangest thing you've done for a woman? What you mean, as far as what? Oh, I don't know. It's like, you know, okay, so I went to hot yoga, which I would never go to hot yoga, but I only went because I went with a girl. I mean, you know, there's certain, I don't know, you might go, like, shopping or, like, oh, let's go look at, the, you know, the, a pet store. You know, there's just things that women can make uh, us do because... It, it, it has to be uh, shopping. I mean, mm. because I'm I'm definitely a type of person when I, when I go in a store, I'm going there, I know what I'm getting, you know, going there with a woman, it's like, oh, uh, man, you got to... Got to go in there and try on the stuff. How do I look? Well, how do you think you look? You the one that wear it, not me. If you think you look good, you look good. I mean. Oh, so that's how you get out of it when they say, how do I look? That's, that's no, really no, smart. I mean, I'm just a very honest person. Okay. If, if I buy something, I don't, I'm not going to ask anybody how I look. I think I look damn good. <laughs> if I got it on. Even if I didn't have it on, I think I look good. So if you try it on, I hope you think you look good in it. You know, you shouldn't have, oh, well, you look okay. Nah, that is low self-esteem. You should have high self-esteem. You look great no matter what you put on. But, Lamar, you know you can't actually tell a woman if it looks like she puts on this ugly green top, it looks good. You can't say that looks terrible, well, can you? you know what? Don't bring me because I'm going to be honest with you. <laughs> you know, I ain't there to stroke you. I'm going to be honest with you. <laughs> I expect you to do the same thing for me. Very nice. Okay, so, so the last thing, I know you got I'll get you out on this. When you guys are, um, when you guys are sitting in the film room, do you guys do your film on Monday? Mondays or Tuesdays? Uh, I mean, after you, after we play on Sunday, we usually come in and watch um, uh, the previous game on um, on Monday. On Monday, okay. So, like, when you're playing a game and you make a big play, say it's like a turnover or you get a big sack, in in the back of your head, do you know that you're going to be smiling on Monday when in the film room when you guys are watching the film in front of the whole team? No, nah, you know, I don't, I don't think about it after the game. Like, oh yeah, I made that nice little play right there. 
I know we're gonna we're gonna rewind that play. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it does come into your head though, right? Like after the, you're on the bus or whatever, you're getting changed. Like, I mean, you 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 know, you put a uh, whooping on a team or something. You that that does creep into your mind, right? Yeah, you be like, yeah, I made that one play, but oh, I hope they don't see that one play. I got dogged on. I just hope they <laughs> somehow skip past that. I don't want them to see that one. Who's the Who's the guy on your team? That will call out his own play when he knows it's coming up in the film room. Like, oh, here we go. Uh, Larry, Larry Foot. <laughs> Larry Foot. And far. what does he do? What does he say? Uh, I mean, he just he's just the loudest guy. I mean, he's the loudest guy on the team, no matter what. He argue about anything from playing pool, to playing on the shuffleboard, ping pong, movie watching. Um, sports, you name it. Larry Foote is always in the argument about something. That's unbelievable, and uh, that's that's so funny. I wish, I wish NFL Films could put us in that room because I'm sure it'd be like it'd be fun. either like what he's saying would be funny, or your guys' reaction to him always talking would also be funny. Man, that's that's all day, every day. All he do is talk trash. Last question is: what's the uh, what's the loudest reaction you've heard in the film room? Whether it's watching one of your own plays, like guys re- reacting to something that you did, or reacting to a teammate's work. Well, see, usually, usually when we watch, usually when we watch film, we break down individual to position wise. So I'd be in the room with all the linebackers. Okay. And uh, once again, it was uh, had to be no, it had to be my coach when uh, Larry Foot got stiffed on one time by Jamal Lewis. <laughs> Because they always – my coach and, you know, Keith Butler and Larry always going back and forth because Keith, Coach Butler used to play for the Seahawks back in the day. Right. So Foot is always talking about he got ran over by um, Marcus Allen. Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, actually, so Coach Butler bought the, brought the tape in uh, when, he, when they played against Marcus Allen because on, on, on – um, Sports Illustrated, it showed him like he got ran over by Marcus Allen. Oh, wow. And I was like, man, you got ran over by Marcus Allen. So it took Bust like two years to finally get the film, and it showed he didn't get ran over by Marcus Allen. Oh, <laughs> he made that a mission to, to, oh, yeah, to uh, validate it. himself. Definitely, definitely did. So it was so when Jamal Lewis stiff armed Larry Foote, that's when, so the coach had the biggest reaction in the room. Yeah, so, you know, once, once, Foote, once Foote was trying to clown him about. Uh, the Sports Illustrated, once Bus showed that he made that tackle, he brought out the Jamal Lewis, um, stiff arm on Larry Foote. That's awesome, man. Well, I hope that uh, in the future your plays generate the loudest reactions in the room, all positive, because uh, you're a beast on the field, and it's awesome watching you work, man. Appreciate it. Make sure you follow me on Twitter, too, man. Yes, and it's uh, – it's, it's, uh, what is your Twitter handle? At Lamar Woodley. At Lamar, I will follow you right now, and uh, you don't need to follow me back. I will. I will. I like being a casual observer, and uh, I know your fans will definitely be clicking on that follow button. Thank you so much for yeah, joining me I'm today, like, man. I'm going to Canada one day, so I gotta follow you so I can call you, let you know I'm on my way. Oh, p- will you actually? What part of Canada? I live in Toronto. Man, I ain't never been to Canada, man. Except when we played in Toronto, that's the only time. Listen, you. Look, okay, can I just? Okay, two things. You got to come up in July or August. Actually, I, I think you'd be in training camp, man. Oh, that's right. You can't come up in the winter time though. It's it's brutal. You gotta. Oh, you can't. Can you sneak away for a weekend? No. Nah, well, when in the summertime? Yeah, I come. I probably come up in the summer. Dude, can you like? There's this one, a Caribbean festival called Carabana, and it's oh, yeah. unbelievable. It's like Not it's like. Happening. I, I heard I heard about it, but it's always doing. Yeah, yeah but you heard good things camp. though. You heard good things though. Yeah, yeah. I heard it. No, I heard it's real nice. Oh man, that's too bad you can't come up then. Okay, okay, maybe it's April or or, or uh, May. We'd love to have you. I'll, I will follow you right now, and and if you ever think about coming up, hit me up, and we'll uh, we'll, we'll make a night of it. All right, definitely, man. It was great talking to you, Lamar. Thank you so much for being I'm, with I'm me. I'm waiting. I'm waiting on you to tweet me, so I'm looking at it right now. So let me know. <laughs> you got it, man. You got it. In closing, that was great. I hope you guys enjoyed that conversation. My first NFL heavy, the mega cast. Next time I'll work on some offensive dudes, but the defense backbone and uh, and that was cool. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you want to follow me on Twitter, that's at the real cabbie, and on Instagram, it's at the real cabbie. And in real life, if you see me, what's up, cabbie? Or why are you looking at my girl, cabbie? That can work too. I'm cabbie. And I'm gone. Thank you for listening to Cabbie Presents, the podcast. 